us. And uh, is it good to pray with one another? Does that feel good to anybody? I was um, just kind of looking around at the beginning of that and uh, so grateful for the opportunity that we have once a month just to kind of put a pause on things. And I know we have people, we have a lot of things that go on on campus on Fridays at 10 o'clock. And so I know not everybody's able to join us, but I know some people are watching on video. Hey, uh, my mom may be watching on video. Hi, mom. Uh, and uh, we, we just are grateful for uh, the opportunity to serve at a place where we can pray with each other and we can lift up each other's burdens. Uh, anybody glad spring break's on the way? We're closed on Monday, y'all know. Y'all staff know that? Your offices are closed on Monday? Uh, I haven't told my wife that yet. I think I'm just going to, like, freak her out or something. But uh, anyways, uh, just a couple of real quick announcements, then a, a little word uh, for the morning. Um, uh, as I said, we're heading into spring break, which means we're about to start the sprint to commencement. Uh, commencement is, like, April 29th. We don't even get to May this year. And uh, that's going to be a great event. We'll, again, we'll be planning to do it outdoors. I don't think we're going to be able to have the gigantic monitor like we had last year, but we will have some very large monitors uh, uh, off to the sides that I think are going to be helpful. And uh, soon we'll announce our commencement speaker. We're really excited uh, to have someone who will be bringing a very personal challenge to our graduates. But uh, we're uh, almost to the end of the 21-22 academic year, which is just insane to think about. As we think about next fall, I'll give you all a couple of statistics. We have record applications for next fall. We have passed 2,100 applications for next year. Now, obviously, we're not going to have 2,100 new freshmen, <laughs> but we've admitted over 1,500, which is a record again. And right now, active deposit students who have already stroked a check for next year are up 15% over last year. And so we kind of think that'll start to narrow a little bit. It's been narrowing the last couple of months. Uh, but we really, really appreciate the work of admissions and financial aid and other groups that have really been working on that. And that's for this fall. The interest for the fall of 23 is absolutely through the roof. We are really having a lot of families come. And what we're starting to see, especially post-COVID, is a lot of the out-of-state interest uh, that's coming down and taking tours. Almost every tour group I see has somebody in it from Pennsylvania, Florida, the Midwest, Minnesota. Uh, we had, I think, nine students from Minnesota for one tour a couple of months ago. So that's, a, yeah, we've got uh, a, a few uh, upper Midwesterners who are giving the shout out on that. We also, you may have heard some whisperings about a uh, capital campaign that we're getting ready to launch. Uh, we will be doing some public details about that soon. The board has been approving the things that they're approving. Uh, and so this is going to be uh, the first significant capital campaign since I've been president. And uh, part of that is going to be a major renovation on Donnan. Donnan has not had a thorough re renovation since it was built in 1955. And so we're going to be uh, reworking the classrooms and offices and other things there uh, to serve the university. And again, we'll have some more information coming out about that soon. Uh, but by the end of the summer, you'll really uh, start to see some changes there. And in capital campaigns, you have the quiet phase and then you have the public phase. The quiet phase of fundraising for this is going incredibly well. And uh, so if we hit enrollment and we've got the fundraising things going, this is going to really position us well uh, for next year. And then just one other thing, we have not overhauled the employee handbook in a very, very long time. Uh, and so if you go through and look at it, there are things that have contradicted the faculty handbook. There are some schools within the academic side of the university that have their own handbooks, and we've had uh, all kinds of just misalignments and things. And then a lot of things have not been looked at in light of current law and legal review and so forth. And so uh, we've had a task force that's been working on that out of HR and uh, legal counsel and things like that. And so the entire employee handbook has been completely uh, overhauled and streamlined. There are some things in there that y'all are gonna be really excited about. There are some things in there that y'all are gonna go, what? So we can't do an executive summary because it's just too many changes, but the document has been uploaded, I think, as of today. You're gonna get an email from Mike Stoll in the business office sending you the link. Uh, and then that'll give you some time to look at it and ask questions. We have an FAQ uh, that's been prepared, and they're going to actually hold like a, 
essentially a meeting where people who have questions about things uh, can come in and ask questions and get clarifications and stuff like that. Uh, and so again, it's, it's a lot of different things that are in there, but uh, by and large, it's stuff that is really gonna strengthen us as a community and help us, especially as we navigate uh, uncertain and choppy legal waters moving into the future uh, with our culture not really liking Christ first institutions. Uh, we've got some clarifications and things like that that are in there. But again, if you have questions or concerns, Mike Stoll in the business office, Michelle Sabo, Beth Hawk, all of them can, can help you with that. And we're gonna do uh, kind of a, a meeting at some point where people will be able to ask questions, uh, not in the too distant future. All right, so let's get to uh, what I hope will be an encouraging word. Can I see a show of hands? How many of you have uttered this phrase in the last few days, weeks, or months? I'm so tired. Can I, can I get a little witness on that? Uh, I have had so many days where Lisa has walked back into the bedroom and said, are you still in bed? And I said, well, I'm a little slow cranking it up this morning, sorry. And uh, I'm the late riser, she's the early riser. Early in our marriage, I was the one that stayed up till midnight or one, and she was the one that got up at five or six. And uh, so it was fun to navigate that as newlyweds. Uh, but uh, I, I hear that phrase, I'm so tired, and it always takes me back to a book I read uh, when I was in high school that became one of the most influential books on my life. It's called Up From Slavery. It's Booker T. Washington's autobiography. And uh, the reason it was so important to me was I grew up in Hampton, Virginia. He went to Hampton uh, Institute at that time, Hampton University now. And uh, we had things that were named for him all over the place, elementary school and uh, roads and things like that. And when I read that book the first time, uh, it was the first time I'd ever read a book where I could imagine myself walking in the places that were mentioned in the book. And so I, I really love the opening parts of that book and his description about growing up in Virginia and getting away from slavery, having the opportunity to go and get an education. It inspired me as I was going on and, and getting my education and everything. Uh, but in the last chapter of the book, uh, it's a section called On Europe, uh, he has been a slave, he's been escaped, he's gotten his education, He's gone to uh, Tuskegee Institute. He's led that institution. He's worked. He's bled his life into that institution. And uh, all of a sudden, his board of trustees mugged him with a trip to Europe. And they said it's a fundraising, friend raising trip. Uh, but what they were really trying to do was get him on a boat for two weeks where he had nothing to do because they were worried about his health and his mental, um, his mental reserves. And in that chapter, he talks about that he had no idea how tired he really was. He said, I knew I was tired, but I had no idea how really tired I was. Can anybody resonate with that? I know I'm tired, but I really don't know how tired I really am. And he said that when he got onto that boat and all of a sudden he had nothing to do for two weeks while they were going across the Atlantic, he said by the second or third day, he finally gave in and he slept for 15 or more hours a day for 10 straight days. By the way, does that sound good to anybody else? Because that sounds like really good to me. Um, and I just, I just want to say, he talks about the pressures of being the head of the Tuskegee Institute, and he talks about the, the burden that he has for his students. He talks about all that. And now that I'm a university president, I really resonate with that in a way I didn't when I was 16, 17 years old. Um, but I also will say this, in my role as president, I also have a pastoral role, and it's not just a pastoral role with you all, with our students, with our alumni. It's also a pastoral role that I have with pastors and faith leaders in the area. Um, because I'm not necessarily a church member, except for Josh Powell, I'm not a church member. Um, but part of my job is, and part of the calling that I have is to be an encourager to people who often don't have people that they can drop their guard with and they can uh, speak very frankly with. And so as I have meals with pastors and nonprofit leaders and other community leaders, politicians, things like that, one of the things that very often will happen is they'll drop their guard and say, can I get you to pray with me about something? Or can I run something by you that I'm really wrestling with? I'm also a deacon at our church at Taylor's. 
And in that, I also have a layer of service that I really take seriously. And even though I'm, I'm on my off rotation right now, I still have people who uh, call me and let me know about surgeries that are going on or crises or whatever, uh, so that I can pray with them or visit with them or just sometimes talk to them and all. And uh, I, I think it's interesting as we headed into the pandemic, I think we all knew that the two weeks to flatten a curve were gonna be hard enough, but who had any idea that it was gonna be two years to crush our spirits, right? Uh, and so that's been hard. And then in February, it felt like we were like, all right, I mean, I'm watching the cases on campus drop, 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 drop. And I'm like, yes, yes. And then Ukraine, it's like, okay, great. It's like a wrestling event and Bart Simpson's bashing a chair over the back of our heads, if you've seen that meme. And so I think we've all felt the, the Ukrainian situation so deeply because not only is it on the screen in the ways that it is, but it feels like we finally were getting released, finally we're getting released, and then all of a sudden reality drops right back in. And so globally, we've had the pandemic and now the potential for uh, maybe even World War III. We've got economic fragility. Nationally, we watched our politics get sharper and sharper and turn into what is really nothing but blood sport. Culturally, we watched little wobbles turn into whiplashing swerves, and it's almost like we're on a roller coaster. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed as I interview new employees is when we ask them about their church involvement, one of the most common responses we get is, my church fell apart during COVID, my family's looking for a new church, or our pastor resigned during COVID, or in a couple of cases, uh, our church closed during COVID, we're having to go find another place. And, and I'll tell you this, Steve Krause and I talk about this frequently in our time together on Monday. We probably have more members of our community who are disconnected from weekly church participation than at any time in our, since our founding in 1892. Because church has also become really a constant. And some of y'all, Sunday mornings when you're getting dressed to go to church, that is actually one of the most stressful times of your week. And I know because some of you have told me that. And many of you are looking for new church communities or you've rethought what it means to be involved at your local church, and that's really hard. I know for a fact there are people in here who have specific burdens for their children and for their grandchildren. Some of these are health burdens. Some of these are marriage burdens. Some of these are just uh, the reality of life in a falling world kinds of burdens. But I know that many, many, many in our community are super stressed right now because of what's going on in their children's lives and their parents' lives in their extended families' lives, and especially in their grandchildren's lives. We have a lot of people here who are praying grandparents right now because of what's going on with health or with families or even with, with all the things we've had at school. A lot of people in our community are dealing with family members that are using drugs and the crisis we have with that, with alcohol, with other things. The effects of all the cultural shifts that we've been watching are stressing out kids. I am so grateful I don't have a child in middle school right now. And for those of you who have children or grandchildren in middle school right now, bless you, we're praying for you, because it's bad. I used to teach middle school English, and I think about the contrast between what I thought was bad then and what students are dealing with now. Man, and then there's health concerns and loss of life. Just in the suite that my office is in in Donnan, I can count six people who are based out of that suite who've lost parents or in-laws just in the last few months. Two of those were uh, to people who had had COVID. And many of you are quietly bearing health problems of your own or for family members or for friends. And then there's the spiritual effects of all the things that are going on in our times. There's so much spiritual weariness right now. And what our culture is calling a mental health crisis that is a mental health crisis is really rooted in a spiritual health crisis that's going on. And I'm not diminishing the mental health. Hear me, I'm not diminishing the mental health. But much of what's going on, our culture doesn't know how to articulate it appropriately but it's a spiritual crisis that is exhibiting itself in mental health problems. And y'all, our students are struggling. Their families are struggling. By the way, their professors are struggling. And I can't imagine K through 12, what's going on in those places right now. And boy, this is a lovely uplifting message this morning. I know you're all uh, feeling that. Um, but, but this is what I know. I know um, when, when I became president, about two or three years in, into my time here, 
I really became convinced that I needed to have a day a month for me to just block it off on the calendar and get away and uh, pray and read scripture and listen and reflect. And one of the things that God has been teaching me is that sometimes prayer is listening a whole lot more than prayer is talking. And uh, I think about Romans 8, 26 through 27, which has come to mean so much to me over the last few years. And this is what the scriptures say. This is out of Romans. Now, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. We do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes on the saints according, for the saints according to the will of God. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm just too tired to speak in prayer, and sometimes I'm just too weary. Sometimes I'm too angry to speak in prayer. But I know that the Spirit of God that is indwelling in each and every one of us as believers does know. And so that's why sometimes I've come to understand that prayer is about the ears as much as it is about the mouth. And sometimes the best thing we can do is to intuit in whatever way that works the prayers of the Spirit to the Father on our behalf. And so as I was heading into chapel today, I don't mean as I was heading in here this morning, I mean as I was heading and praying about what to share, uh, God really, I felt like, led me to, to want to do this. John chapter 17 is sometimes called the high priestly prayer of Christ. And these are the last words that, uh, the, that this gospel records from Christ before his betrayal and his arrest. And by the way, we're heading into Easter. I took Good Friday communion in Ukraine over a decade ago with a with a congregation there. And so as I'm heading into Easter, I always think of that Good Friday service, and this year especially, I'm thinking of those pastors uh, that are still serving in that church in eastern Ukraine, almost right there at Kharkiv, just about uh, 30 miles from where all the fighting is right now. And and I, I remember that they were reading out of the Gospels as a part of that um, Last Supper, that Lord's Supper that we were observing there. And so what I want to do today, just to end our time together, I'm going to read John 17, but I want us to read it as a prayer. And so I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads, and I want to just read this passage to you. It'll take us a moment, but it's only one chapter. Um, but I want to read this prayerfully and listen to these words of Christ as he prays for the disciples, not just the ones that are there, for all of us through all of these ages that he loves so much. And, and bear in mind these words that these are the last words that John records before chapter 18 where it begins with Jesus' betrayal as arrest, Peter's denial, and so forth. So listen to these words and then I'll conclude us. Jesus spoke these things, looked up to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the Son may glorify you, since you gave him authority over all flesh, so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. I have revealed your name to the people you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. And now they know that everything you have given is from you because I have given them the words you gave me. They have received them and have known for certain that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me because they are yours. Everything I have is yours and everything you have is mine and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. 
while I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them is lost except the son of destruction, so that the scripture may be fulfilled. And now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy completed in them. I have given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so that they may also be sanctified by the truth. I pray not only for these, but also for those that believe in me through their word. May they all be as one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. I've given them the glory you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me, so that they may be made completely one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you love me. And Father, I want those you have given me to be with you where I am so that they will see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. Righteous Father, the world has not known you. However, I have known you and they have known that you sent me and I made your name known to them and will continue to make it known so that the love you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. God, we are grateful for these words. Thanks be to God for these words. And we are thankful for the prayers that you prayed. We are the ones who have received the word that was sent forth from the ones who received the word from you. God, we can't imagine singing songs like we sang this morning in the subways of a city like Kiev or Kharkiv or other places around the world, but we know that there are Christians who even in those places are singing songs like those about your love and about your protection and about your son. And so God, even as we feel tired, God, help us to know that you also have been tired. As we feel tempted, help us to know that you have also been tempted. God, as we love one another, help us to do it in ways that you also have loved us. And so, God, we just pray, even today, as we head into a three-day weekend, that we will have time to catch up on rest as we head into the sprint of the rest of the semester, that you will give us the energy that we need, but, God, also that you will give us the attenuation to stop and pause and know who might need a word from us or who might need the gospel from us or who might need uh, just an encouraging pat on the back from us to know that you, we love as you love as the Father loved and that we can see unity in all of these things. And so, Christ, we pray all these things in Jesus' name today. Amen. Thanks. Y'all have a great day.